Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second of two lectures on the diversification of life for week 13. Today, we're going to talk about protists and plants, um, two of some of my most favorite groups of organisms. So the agenda for today is pretty simple. We're going to talk about what a protist is, why they're, why they're really neat. And then full disclosure, I studied plants for my graduate work. They're one of my favorite groups of organisms. I went to college having no idea what plants were, took a class on the diversity of plants, and then decided that's what I was going to study. Um, so really amazing uh, groups of organisms today, continuing our discussion of the diversification of living things. So by the end of this lecture, I really hope that you take away um, what kind of group that protists are. So they're a little bit different than the other groups we've been talking about so far. Um, walk away from this lecture being able to describe the ecological contributions of protists and plants, so how protists and plants interact with their environment, with other organisms, things along that nature. Be able to describe the various adaptations that plants gained when they transitioned to land. So that was a really big deal um, in the history of Earth um, when organisms were able to colonize these big land masses. And then just like the, the previous lecture and also the case with the one next week, um, it's my goal for you guys to start to appreciate the breadth of diversity, just the sheer amount of amazingness that exists in the natural world. So today is all about protists and plants. So we saw this image a couple times in the previous lecture. Um, it's a little bit different than your book, so just kind of to dig into it a little bit more. So your textbook has a really good um, discussion of, of how there are three domains of living things. So domain being this um, largest category that we can bend life into. So bacteria are their own lineage. Archaea, which we talked about last time, are their own lineage in this gray box right here. And then eukaryotes, so things like us, things like plants, um, are their own lineage. So this is something that scientists have thought about for a long time, um, that there are three domains. However, when we look at different kinds of evidence, um, there might only be two. And so that's what we see in this diagram on the right. So it could be the case that bacteria are their own lineage. There was a speciation event that led to all of archaea. Um, and instead of there being another speciation event that separates things with the nucleus, so eukaryotes, from archaea, it could be that within archaea, one of these lineages, or one of the lineages that lived at this time, gave rise to eukaryotes. rather than being a separate group. So if it's the case where eukaryotes originated from within one of these groups of archaea, then that would tell us that there are two domains. And so that's what we call this archaeal host hypothesis. So how does that work? Well, we'll get into kind of how that might have arisen in a, in a slide or two down the road. So are there three domains of life? Scientists still aren't sure. We're still looking at it. But in any case, for this lecture and the next one next week, we're talking about eukaryotes. So eukarya means um, true nucleus. So the nucleus is a really special organelle in cells. It's what separates things like humans, plants, fungi from bacteria and archaea. So if we remember back to our fossils and phylogenies um, lecture, we defined Synapomorphy. That's that trait that brings together a huge group of organisms, a shared derived trait. And in the case of eukaryotes, that synapomorphy is a nucleus. So anything that has a nucleus is in the group eukarya. If we look back to the fossil record, we see they show up about 1.8 billion years ago. So this is a little bit different than the, the slide I posted in Moodle. Um, I did a little bit of background research before I recorded this. In this image, scientists, when they first found this fossil, were really, really excited because clearly here we can see these things that look like nuclei. So that would have meant that um, 
eukaryotes arose at whenever this organism was alive. So it was a little more than 2 billion years ago. Uh, but when I looked it up, actually, scientists took more closer looks at this and other things and realized that these things that look like nuclei probably aren't and are just kind of the cell contents all squished together. Um, so people think this is probably cyanobacteria rather than a true eukaryote. Um, oh well. So now we know that it's about 1.8 billion years ago that eukaryotes first come on the scene. Okay, so eukaryotes are really exciting. They have this cool nucleus. Another really interesting thing about eukaryotes is we have those organelles. So we have mitochondria, plants and other things have chloroplasts, Golgi, vesicles, all those good things. Um, and the reason we have mitochondria and some organisms have chloroplasts is most likely due to this process called endosymbiosis. What the heck does that mean? Well, if we take a look at mitochondria and chloroplasts, they actually remind us more of bacteria than they do of eukaryotic components. So we think, based on what we know about uh, mitochondria and bacteria, that a long time ago there could have been this archaeon organism doing its best life. And along came a bacteria that it engulfed, but didn't degrade. So this might have been um, something that could provide the archaeon energy, like a mitochondria. So instead of eating it for food, it just decided to let it hang out. So that bacterial thing survived within this archaeal cell. And then it grew and divided and continued to have this bacterial thing inside the cell. And over millions and billions of years, um, that original free-living bacteria would have just ended up being another component of that cell. So this is a process that probably led to the mitochondria that we have today. It's also a process that might have um, generated eukaryotic cells in the first place. So this might be one of those explanations for that archaea host hypothesis. If a certain group of archaea engulfed the right kind of bacteria that turned into a mitochondrion. All right, so long story short, instead of eating it, this archaea, archaeal cell decided to hang on to this bacteria, and so we can see that process result in a mutual beneficial relationship. So that could have happened really early on in cellular history. It's also an ongoing process, so a lot of different protists do this with, with other organisms. Um, and so we'll look at protists more closely in the next couple of slides. Okay, so what the heck is a protist anyway? Um, instead of being able to point to a specific trait, essentially protists are all eukaryotes that aren't plants, fungi, or animals. So not the most helpful definition, but it encompasses just this huge amount of diversity of life on Earth. So over 100,000 recognized species, um, that means that it's something scientists can grow in the lab and look at and describe. Um, there's probably thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands more out there that we haven't described yet. Most protists are unicellular, um, but some of them can actually grow to be gigantic. So this paramecium here is a really good example of a protist. Um, you put together different populations of protists for that predator-prey lab all the way back when we were on campus. Um, some of these protists are organisms called diatoms. They have these very beautiful structures. A lot of them are marine organisms, um, but they're, they're all kinds of life. So again, this idea of having a shared derived trait that separates one group from the rest, we don't have that for protists. It's kind of this catch-all group that describes everything that's not a plant, fungus, or animal. And so thinking back to those different types of groups that we talked about in relation to phylogenetic trees, if we have a common ancestor, 
but we're not including all of its descendants, that's an example of a paraphyletic group. So protists as a, as a whole are paraphyletic. We can point to the common ancestor of protists. It's the same common ancestor that we, plants, and fungi share. Therefore, protists as a group is paraphyletic. Okay, so getting back to, to some cool examples. So on the on the whole, most protists live either in the water, in a in a freshwater or a saltwater environment. So rivers, streams, lakes, um, or the open ocean. And again, uh, one of the most striking groups of these are called diatoms. Just really amazing under the microscope. Um, very very small creatures. Some of them can grow to be really huge, though. So kelp forests are made of kelp, which is a protist. They provide habitat for all kinds of things. They photosynthesize. They provide oxygen to that environment. So kelp forests are really important ecosystems in the ocean. And then we have places where kind of freshwater and saltwater meet called um, intertidal habitats. So things like sea palms, so named because they look like little miniature palm trees, are a really special group of protists that live in this environment. So some of them are microscopic, and some of them can be pretty gigantic. So lots of variety in protists. OK, so thinking back to how they um, use and develop and produce energy, some protists can be predators, like we saw in our lab. They can ingest prey by engulfing it and bringing it into their cell. Others can photosynthesize. So we also saw that in our lab. The ones that were green under the microscope were able to um, use this, the sunlight for energy. So this protist can put out the structure called a pseudopod and whomp, take in this, this uh, organism right here, and others can photosynthesize. So it runs the span of the food web. OK, so looking at what protists contribute, um, they, they're at every single level, um, every single aspect of the food web. So in the ocean, um, they can be food for lots of different marine animals. Um, zooplankton and phytoplankton are both examples of protists. If we look at this cartoon over here, right, if they can photosynthesize, they produce energy. They can be some primary producers. Um, they can also scavenge or break down different things. Um, so some things can decompose shells. Um, but there's also predatory protists, which we saw. So they can also be primary consumers. So they can be eating other things in the environment. And no matter kind of which aspect of the food web they're in, eventually they will die and sink to the ocean floor. Um, so things like shells and other protists, um, excuse me, shells and protists, those diatoms, other things, can fall to the bottom and accumulate here. So there's different layers of Earth's history that are developed from these layers of protists um, over time. OK, so they can eat other things. They can be food for other things. They can provide um, habitat like those kelp forests. Protists are also really cool because they can reproduce in a couple different ways. So some of them can reproduce um, sexually. Some of them can also reproduce asexually. They can also do this really amazing um, life cycle where sometimes they're haploid, so they only have one copy of all of their genetic information, and sometimes they're diploid. They can have really complex life cycles, and it just runs the gamut. Again, that's kind of um, par for the course when you're in a group of organisms that's this huge um, section of diversity, lots of diversity and how they reproduce as well.
Okay, so that was Protus in a nutshell. Again, there's thousands and thousands of species. They do really amazing things and are really important to many different environments. Um, but now we're going to transition to plants, one of the coolest groups of all time. So if you think of plants as these things that just kind of sit around um, and don't do much, hopefully something you learn from this class will kind of change your opinion about that. They have um, really amazing adaptations for how to grow and survive. And something I don't really mention extensively in these slides um, are the compounds they can make. So if you drink coffee or go to Starbucks, you can think the coffee plant, so that dose of caffeine. Um, plants can do all these really cool, amazing things. But in any case, I'll stop myself from getting too far off track and point you guys to this um, summary of how we think these different groups are related. So the, the most, um, or the, the group that's related to the rest of the plants is uh, Chlorophyta. Along with these other lineages, um, they can all be kind of lumped into a group we call green algae. Then we have these relationships between what we call bryophytes, things like mosses and liverworts, um, things that kind of grow really close to the ground. Then we have club mosses and quillworts, which are really unique groups of organisms, things like ferns. And then we get into gymnosperms. Um, gymnosperm means naked seeds, so plants that have seeds including huge redwoods, um, cycads, conifers, and then flowering plants, the most diverse group of organisms. So all of these are the true plants, or zero to plant you. In terms of what I want you to take away, I don't really care that you know the names of these different groups, but just kind of opening your eyes now to the diversity of plants that are out there. OK, so this is just a small um, array of the different types of plants that we see. So here are those organisms that we call green algae. Here's a really close-up picture of moss and some of their reproductive structures right here. Liverwort, we can go through. These are a really amazing um, group of plants called horsetails, ferns, ginkgo, redwoods. So these are all plants um, that are not flowering plants. So again, just a glimpse into all of the different uh, types of plants that are out there. OK, so green algae are kind of a, another catch-all group for a lot of different things related to other plants. So there's many, many kinds of species of green algae. And just like protists, they range from unicellular to, to large things. Again, a lot of aquatic um, plants are green algae. So plants live in the water, lots of different kinds. Um, and in the history of the world, plants started out being aquatic. And then over time, they were able to evolve and were able to um, develop adaptations that helped them move on to a dry land environment. Um, I also study fungi, so I couldn't ignore them in this process. Um, but a long, long time ago, plants were able to kind of um, work together with fungi and colonize these dry land environments. So here on the bottom of this slide, we see um, a timeline approximately of when different groups of these plants emerged. So about 475 million years ago is when we see the first evidence that plants moved onto land. And these are kind of different examples of adaptations that arose um, in these different groups. So land plants show up for the first time about 475 million years ago. Then we see other really amazing um, plant-specific adaptations show up like roots and leaves. So not all plants have roots. Um, so going forward, then, we see um, 
coal-forming swamps. So the reason we burn coal, the reason coal exists, is because of all these deposits from plants that were growing um, a really, really long time ago. So that's the, the Carboniferous period, um, thanks to plants. And then about 300 million years ago, we see gymnosperms come out for the first time. And then about 145 million years ago, we see flowers for the first time. Okay, so thinking back to then, that transition from water to land, what do plants need in order to go from floating in the ocean or a stream or a lake uh, to moving on to a dry surface? Well, kind of the first thing you need to do is make sure that you can retain water. So plants have a really important um, layer on the outside of their leaves and other things called a cuticle. So just like you have a, a cuticle in your nails, a plant cuticle helps keep the moisture in. So a really important adaptation for being able to be on a, a dry environment. Another thing you have to do, so just like you put on sunscreen to protect from the really harsh sun, uh, once you get up out of the water, you need a way to protect um, your cells from UV damage. And so plants have really cool molecules or compounds called flavonoids. Um, and often they're these really dramatic pigments. Um, so geraniums are red because of this specific type of flavonoid. Roses have a very specific kind of, of flavonoid, et cetera. So again, these are molecules that help protect the plants from getting damage from the sun. So they need the sun for photosynthesis, but they also need to protect from damage. Another really important thing that uh, it was important for plants to have is structure. So some kind of way of staying upright. When you're in the water, you don't have to worry about having structure, um, but when you're out of that fluid force, you need something to, to keep you in the right direction. So if you have celery around, you can cut that open and see the different um, types of vascular tissue. So kind of like we have veins, our bloodstream brings nutrients around, plants have vascular tissue. So that provides some structure. It also allows um, the plant to transport water and other nutrients. Um, so all plants have some kind of arrangement of different cell types that help them transport sugars, uh, minerals, water, etc. Um, it was also really important to have a way of reproducing outside of the water. So a lot of aspects of reproduction um, were important adaptations for land plants. So kind of taking a step back and thinking about reproduction and plants as a whole, so this applies to aquatic things and land plants. Um, just like in those protists, some plants have what we call an alternation of generations. So alternating between haploid and diploid. So some plants, like this cool cycad right here, is diploid. There are certain cells that will undergo meiosis, and it'll produce some spores. So those are haploid. They've undergone meiosis. Instead of fusing with another spore, they'll just start growing. Um, so these will grow up into um, another part of the plant that's all haploid. So mosses have um, a structure that's mostly haploid until it needs to reproduce. So then it can make um, gametes that fuse to form this other stage. So some plants, instead of just being diploid all the time, will transition in between haploid and diploid. So a really unique way of reproducing. Um, so then thinking about why it's important to be able to reproduce um, differently in water or on land. If you're a plant in the water, you can just release your gametes or release your spores, and you don't have to worry about where they'll go. Right? The, the water will carry them somewhere. They'll meet up. They'll find another place to colonize. On land, though, you need a way to get your gametes and your spores to move around. 
So mosses and other things that grow really closely to the ground um, have sperm that are able to swim. So they are able to transition and develop these um, sperm. They still use the water, um, but it's a way of getting around that barrier. So moths are able to have swimming sperm. That's one way they've been able to get around um, being underwater. Ferns have spores that can travel through the air. So one adaptation that allows them to um, grow kind of a little bit farther from the water. And then seed plants, so gymnosperms and flowering plants are able to produce pollen. So you can um, thank your allergies. You can thank a lot of these plants um, and their pollen for your allergies. Spring, um, which it is right now, at least in central Illinois, um, has arrived. And with that, lots and lots of plant reproduction. That's what pollen is for. OK, so continuing on um, why pollen is important. If you've ever parked your car or um, had a, a surface outside that was covered in this yellow dust, that was pollen. Um, and pollen contains the sperm cells from plants that need to get from the parent plant then to a flower or other structure where they can fertilize the egg cells in another plant and produce more plants. So seed plants have this adaptation um, for being independent from the water to reproduce. So pollen cells are really diverse in their shapes and sizes. Some travel on the wind, some travel on other animals. Really cool ways of dispersing pollen. Um, but they have sperm cells inside and a tough outer coating that protects them on the outside. So once some pollen from one plant meets the egg cells of a new plant, they're able, um, if they're gymnosperms or angiosperms or flowering plants, they're able to make seeds. Um, so once the, the sperm cells fertilize the egg cells, they're able to make a seed, and that contains the embryo of the plant. So all of the cells needed to grow an entirely new plant. Um, so if we're looking at this bean seed right here, if, you're, if you cut one open, you can see um, the cells that will become the rest of the plant. And then they also have these little seed leaves ready to go. Those are the first little leaves that will pop up out of the ground to feed that growing plant. And then they also have kind of like a backpack full of snacks. They have some um, food storage to sustain them and help them grow up out of the soil. OK, so that's in a nutshell. Seeds, again, we could spend a whole um, semester, a whole year, um, a whole lifetime studying plants. So not only do they have to figure out how to disperse pollen, but once you make a seed, you don't want it to necessarily just fall right at the bottom of where you are. You want them to, to move around and disperse. And plants have tons and tons of different ways of getting their seeds to move around. So if, you've, um, if you have a maple tree nearby, you might have seen these seeds um, that look like helicopters as they're falling. So that's a specific kind of shape. Um, that their fruits and seeds take. Dandelions have a really good way of dispersing their seeds on a structure that floats on the wind. Some of them have barbs um, or other kind of things that cling on to animal fur. Others make really delicious fruit. So animals will eat the fruit, and in so doing, ingest the seeds. They'll move to a new spot. Um, eject them in their scat or in their poop, and then you're able to get plants in a new spot. Um, so even though there's lots of plants on land, some of them still take advantage of the water. Coconuts have some of the largest seeds in plants, and they're able to kind of put them on the ocean and have them float to a new environment. Some of them actually burst open and disperse seeds that way. Um, and then others rely on humans um, 
to disperse their seeds and keep them, um, to have them reproduce. So things like wheat are highly cultivated, corn, soybeans, lots of fruit trees like almonds and cherries, etc. rely on humans. Okay, so this is seed dispersal. Lots of different methods for getting their seeds around. Um, we talked about metabolism with these different groups of organisms. Um, we've talked about photosynthesis already in class. So that's one uh, big way that plants get energy. But there are some plants that don't photosynthesize at all. So there are some like this um, Indian pipe or Monotropa uniflora. It's completely white, right? It's not green. So these plants rely on fungi for their energy. So they don't use the sun's energy at all. They're able to get their nutrients from fungi that grow in their roots. Um, this plant, this witchweed, has these pink flowers right here. It's growing right next to this corn plant. Um, so this is a plant that actually parasitizes other plants. So this plant is striga or witchweed, and it's a really big problem um, in Africa and other places because it takes, saps the nutrients from important crop plants. And then this is a really amazing plant that completes its whole life cycle completely underground. This is an orchid in Australia called Zizanthella gardneri. Um, again, gets its nutrients from fungi. It doesn't use the sunlight at all because it grows completely underground. Okay, so we talked about metabolism. Um, we talked about reproduction. And so just like protists, just like bacteria and viruses, plants um, contribute a lot to the ecology, to their surrounding environment. Um, so often different types of places are defined based on what plants are growing there. So grasslands are called grasslands because grasses dominate the environment. They provide habitat and food, um, fuel, lots of resources for humans and other organisms. So they're producing oxygen, they're able to, with their roots in the soil, um, transform the landscape and prevent erosion um, because plants are really good at retaining water. They can be a source of water. Um, they provide shade. They can be a barrier for wind. Um, really important for regulating the global climate as a whole. Um, so many, many, many reasons. Um, for why they're important to the ecology. And kind of bringing it closer to home, um, plants are also important for medical reasons. So the very first medicines that we had came from plants. Um, different indigenous groups have very, very strong knowledge of which plants are useful for different things. Um, if you, This is an image of an old book um, I think from about the, the 1300s, uh, these are called herbals. So people that knew plants really well were able to draw what they look like and describe their importance and what they treated. Um, so some of them might not be completely accurate or held up by modern medical science, but some of them are. Um, so aspirin is derived from willow bark, for example. So lots of plants do um, contribute to our health for medicine, for treating diseases or different maladies, um, but also just for general nutrition every day. So every day we're eating some kind of plant in one form or another. So nutrients and minerals, but also for fiber. Even if we can't digest it, it's really important for our health. Okay, so kind of coming back to... Um, how different groups are related to one another. Flowering plants, also called angiosperms, are the most diverse group we see today. So that wasn't necessarily true for the whole history of, of plants evolution, but today if we survey what kind of plants, um, what the different kinds of plants are, we see angiosperms pop up the most. So having a flower, that structure, um, helped these 
groups of organisms that diverge into tons of new species. So when we survey, there are about 300,000 that we know of that exist. Um, these are really amazingly preserved flower fossils. And here's just a snapshot of the diversity of flowering plants that we have. So it's, it's um, the beginning of spring in central Illinois, um, probably very similar to the, the other regions where you guys currently are. Um, so if you have the opportunity to go outside to experience what's blooming now, there's tons of things popping up. Um, in general, they're called spring ephemerals. So I have a couple magnolia trees in my yard that are, are full of flowers right now. Um, tulips and other things are starting to come up. Um, so take a minute and kind of explore the different plants that are growing around nearby. But tons of different types of flowers, colors, shapes, um, strategies for getting their seeds across, um, just, just tons of different diversity that plants have. Okay, so again, an angiosperm is something that has a flower, and that's what encourages pollination. So here, this flower is recruiting this bee to transfer to transfer the pollen from one flower to another. Um, but they don't just look pretty. Some of them also smell pretty or not so pretty. In the case of this plant right here, um, they might attract animals based on their color, um, if they provide nectar, as food. Um, some of them smell like rotten meat. So a lot of plants or flowers that are brown or dark like this have a really gross smell and that's to attract flies which then are able to pollinate uh, different flowers. So really unique strategies for encouraging animals to come by and spread their pollen. Um, in the greenhouse that was near my lab um, when I was doing my graduate work, there was a flower that looked kind of like this. It was more white, um, and it smelled just like sweaty gym socks. When they bloomed, it was really gross. So lots of different strategies for, for pollination and reproducing. Um, kind of going back to their medical importance, flowering plants all produce fruits of some kind. So fruits are just a structure that encases their seeds. Um, botanically speaking, a fruit is a ripened ovary. Um, so I don't, I don't care that you know the different parts of a flower, but where the um, structures that become the seeds are, are encased in an ovary, that will ripen and develop into all the different fruits that we eat. Um, so tomatoes botanically are a fruit. Things like apples, coconuts, acorns, another example of a fruit these are developing from that flower and have those seeds available. Um, so another uh, way of dispersing their seeds, they make uh, a really delicious way to encourage animals to eat them. So strawberries, watermelon, oranges, lemons, dragon fruit, pomegranate, all kinds of different um, flowering plants. All right, so that was another whirlwind overview of, of the diversification of life. We talked about protists and how they're paraphyletic. We talked about the different um, contributions that protists make. They can have these kelp forests. They can be producers. They can also prey on other things. Um, plants and protists have really unique ways of reproducing. So just hopefully you can kind of broaden your appreciation for these different groups of organisms. So once you've reviewed this information, go ahead and take the quiz. Again, live on Moodle. That was the second of two lectures for this week. You should have everything you need um, to, to get the content for this week. Um, and you'll hear from me about the second phylogenetic presentation um, soon. Again, thanks for your attention. Um, I'm glad this lines up with when a lot of the, the new flowers are coming out. So I hope you can experience um, some of these plants for yourselves. All right, until next week, 